you join me as we uh, take this opportunity to quieten our minds, to focus ourselves and ready ourselves together to come before the Lord in prayer and to hear His voice uh, and to respond. So as we do that in the quiet, as the musicians play, let's prepare ourselves to hear God's Word. We see the Lord Jesus Christ, who for a while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. We're going to begin by singing a hymn of praise, number 320 in these blue books of ours, name of all majesty, fathomless mystery, king of the ages by angels adored, power and authority, splendor and dignity. Bow to his majesty. Jesus is Lord. Number 320.
Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God, we come before you this Lord's Day morning, and we do so glad in the knowledge that we come in the name of your majestic Son, one through whom you created all things, everything seen and unseen and the one through whom you've restored all things forever. The praise of your glorious grace, darkness defeated and Eden restored for all who are your children through faith in Jesus Christ and will follow him to the glory of the world to come, the glory that he has already inhabited in a kingdom which is everlasting, never to fail, And so, Lord, we rejoice to join our praise with all the saints the world over, all who this day will gather together as we are doing, to praise the Lord Jesus Christ, to hear his word, to bow the knee to him in the presence of all the angels of heaven and all the ransomed all through the years as together we gladly sing, Jesus is Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that our Lord Jesus is our true hope who shows to us the crowning glory of of your salvation in his risen life. That he is our great hero, a champion of our salvation, who has promised to lead us also into that glory. What a wonder that is, that he, the glorious, the majestic Prince of Heaven, that he should come to this earth for us, frail flesh, sinful flesh, and that he's not ashamed to call even such as we are, his brothers and his sisters. Forgive us, Lord, therefore, for the many times when we have been ashamed to be called the brother of our Lord or the sister of our Lord, to stand for him. Grant us help, we pray, You know our frailty. You know what it is to suffer testing to the very extreme, far greater than any of us will ever know. But that means, Lord, you know us. You're able to help us. And you promise to help us. So draw near to us this morning, we pray, so that in hearing your voice, we may be strengthened. And we may gain all the help that we need to follow you, to love you, to trust you for another week and every day of this week to come. So hear us, Lord. Come to us and help us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning. And uh, especially if you're with us for the first time, maybe just visiting or uh, perhaps new to Glasgow, maybe you're a new uh, student to the city and uh, you're uh, checking us out here. Well, you're very welcome indeed. Um, You have these notice sheets, I think, on your chairs and uh, inside, I think, there's a a, a leaflet for students. You can look at that. That tells you all the different things that are going on in the life of our our church. Um, In the inside of the leaflets, there are things that go on during uh, the week this week. You'll see that Wednesday evening, um, down at the bottom of the uh, right-hand side there, we have a congregational prayer meeting. That's the time when once a fortnight we come together from across our congregations to pray together as a fellowship, as one, to unite our voices in calling on the Lord to help us in our many ministries, but principally with our many mission partners, ministry partners all around the world, all around this country. It's a really key time. It's the heart of our life as a fellowship. So do come and join us um, and uh, add your prayers uh, to that meeting. It's here at 7.30 on Wednesday. You'll see on Thursday, we have our uh, Release the Word. That's our main gathering for students and young workers and international Bible study. Uh, That's all on. If you don't know about that, there'll be uh, people around afterwards can tell you a little bit more. We'd love to see you at 6.45 to come and eat and then uh, share fellowship and study God's Word uh, together. And there are lots of other things there going on in the life of the church this week. Um, Do have a read of those and look and see if you can perhaps be involved in some of them. We meet again uh, this evening. We have uh, two evening meetings uh, in English. That's one at 4.30 at Queen's Park, one at 6.30 down at the Kelvin Grove building, and then the Farsi service here at 5.30. We'd love for you to come and join us in these. 
and uh, in one of them. So pick your language and come along, and uh, you'll be very, very welcome indeed. One or two other notices on the back page there. Uh, notice that uh, Christmas is coming. Goodness, what a thought that is. But uh, Matt is already getting ready for Christmas concerts, and um, emails going around about that this week. If you'd like to know more or be involved in that, uh, if you'd like, basically what it means is if you'd like Matt to tell you whether you can actually sing or not, then uh, speak to Matt, and um, he will help guide your gift in an appropriate direction, shall I say? Uh, as long as you're willing for that direction to be um, not into the choir, then he'd be glad to hear from you. But he is very keen to have singers uh, to join. Um, I think we have a little video now uh, from one of our students just saying a word about uh, students in the trunk. I'm Sarah, I'm a third year prosthetics and orthotics student at Strathclyde and I grew up in Guildford. On my first Sunday at the Tron, I actually didn't think that the Tron would become my church while I was in Glasgow, just because my home church is so different in style um, to the Tron. But after a really warm welcome and truthful Bible teaching and getting to know students and also people of all different ages in the Tron, I decided that I'd really like to call the Tron my church family while I'm in Glasgow. I'm on the creche team where on a Sunday I look after the toddlers at Central. I've also been part of Release the Word where we have dinner, which is a time of fellowship with other students. And also it's just great to be able to have your dinner cooked for you once a week. We then, after dinner, break into a Bible study um, as a group. I've also benefited from having a one-to-one -one with an older Christian. This is where we do a Bible study or simply have a coffee where we can catch up. But I found it really encouraging to be able to talk things through with a more mature Christian than me. Another way I've been supported is through being adopted into a church family. So I've been adopted by a wonderful couple who occasionally take us out for dinner, um, look out for us at church on Sundays, but also really love us well. I would say don't rule out a church just because it's different to a church you've been to before. I didn't think I'd end up at the Tron, but actually I love it here and I really enjoy being part of the church family here. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, we're going to turn to our Bibles and uh, to our reading for this morning, which you'll find in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you have a church a Bible, one of the blue Bibles, it's page 1001. Uh, we started a couple of weeks ago our, a study in this uh, book, this letter. Um, it's really a sermon. It's really a written sermon, a word of exhortation. That's what the writer says at the end. A word written to a church full of Christians who were facing uh, struggle, pressures, crisis, uh, to encourage them, exhort them in their faith, uh, to endure and to endure to the end. And we already looked at chapter 1 where uh, we read of God's great revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days uh, to the world to show us the ultimate revelation of God to man and indeed to give God's ultimate warning to the human race in the gospel of his son. And uh, now we pick up reading at chapter 2 and verse uh, 5, where he says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we're speaking. It's been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he's left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, that is, to man. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. We see him crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, 
he in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder or the, some versions say the captain, I prefer the champion, should make the champion of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies, who, who sets apart, and those who are sanctified all have one origin, literally are all of one. And that's why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself was tested when he suffered. The ESV doesn't, doesn't read this very well here. It's not that he was uh, suffering temptation. It's that he was tested or tempted greatly through what he suffered. Because he himself was tested greatly through what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tempted or tested. Amen. May God bless to us his word. We're going to sing again, uh, number 322, a hymn that picks up this theme of the great revelation of God, the ultimate revelation of God in Jesus Christ, his son. No other prophet ever spoke so clearly to our race. No bright and shining angel matched the glory on his face. Number 322.
well as our offerings for the Lord's work are received now, the musicians will play quietly. It's an opportunity for you to perhaps read again the words that we'll be studying shortly in uh, Hebrews 2, or perhaps just meditate on the words of that hymn, which encapsulates so much of uh, the message of this book of Hebrews. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings will be received. Let's pray together. Lord, as we bring these offerings before you and as we join them to the giving of our church in many ways, all the financial contributions that are made, but also the contributions of time, of our gifts, of many prayers as we pray together and as we seek to work together, playing our part in the mission of your glorious kingdom, which is worldwide with partners all throughout the world who love the same Lord, who proclaim the same gospel. We lift this world before you, Lord, with all its great needs, many challenges facing your church in so many different nations. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ, of whom our Lord Jesus is not ashamed, are facing this day great suffering, great trial, temptation through hostile governments or through hostile neighbors in their population where they may be a very significant minority and are persecuted. We think of parts of the world or today where to name the name of Christ openly is to face extreme suffering, imprisonment and perhaps even death. We thank you, Lord, for agencies like the Barnabas Fund, like Release International, that in their news keep reminding us of our brothers and sisters around the world who need our prayers, who need our support, sometimes in other ways, financially and otherwise. We remember especially, Lord, Christian Rohingya people in the camps in Bangladesh people displaced from Burma, but largely unknown to the world, the Christian subpopulation in these camps now, in addition to their plight and their dispossession, being regularly attacked and even killed by the majority Muslim population of these camps. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for help. Pray for protection from the authorities and for the publicizing of their plight that other people in the world might raise their cause with the United Nations, with the Bangladeshi government, and again also put pressure upon the Burmese government 
to bring them and the many other displaced Rohingya back into that land. We think of the many widows of Christian believers in Pakistan that were spoken of in the Barnabas Fund news this week who are left vulnerable and often oppressed by the family of their deceased relative, pressurized to go home, to be with them, to renounce their Christian faith and to return to the fold of Islam. We think of one such widow, Lord, whom we've been praying for very particularly through our brother Imran. And we thank you for the way that he and his colleagues have been able to protect her and rescue her. But we ask for her and for many others like her that they would find the help, the protection, the love, the care, the funding from Christian brothers and sisters who, like the Lord Jesus, are unashamed to own them and stand with them. Lord, as we think of our many brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, so often we're shamed and we ask, Lord, that you would look upon us in this nation where we are so free, so privileged, have had so much, and yet so often are the ones who are ashamed to stand for the Lord Jesus. We pray for our churches, Lord, where even leaders in the public eye of the Christian faith in this nation seem increasingly pressurized, tempted, seduced to find a form of godliness that is compatible with this world, at peace with this world, and at one with this world. Lord, the pressures are great, and we need your strength. We need your encouragement. We need your warnings to stand firm and to stand true. So we pray for your churches, wherever they're gathered, as we are this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask, Lord, that the true word of the true Lord Jesus Christ would be heard, proclaimed, believed and obeyed and rejoiced in and shared. For this gospel and this gospel alone is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. This gospel of a world to come which is everlasting, and which never will be shaken. So, Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we ask for ourselves that you would open our hearts and open our minds, bend our knee before you. Thrill us, we pray, with the truth of your true gospel and bind us to it that we might live for you now and always to the end of our days, faithful to Christ and joyful in the gospel you have given us to share. So hear us, Lord, and help us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to God's Word, we're going to sing together the words on the screen, which is a prayer, really, now in reverence and awe. We gather round your Word. <coughs>
Well, turn with me, if you would, to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, where these verses this morning tell us all about the hope for the world to come. It's very easy, I think, to be pessimistic about this world, and certainly at the moment our news is bombarding us with pessimism, about politics, about economics, uh, about the uh, nature, the world of nature, and uh, climate change, emergencies, and so on, never off the agenda. And of course, there's a lot of anger around, a lot of anger uh, directed at people. People are the problem. Other people, of course, never me. Other people are the problem. Uh, but I read a piece this week about um, the danger of imminent population collapse in uh, the world, because worldwide, the Reproductive age population, the age of 15 to 40 year olds, is falling rapidly in every single continent except Africa. Did you know that? I didn't. And uh, the age of the under 15s, the number of under 15s in the world is declining even more so. So there's great fear, pessimism about increasingly elderly population uh, with fewer and fewer workers to support them. And that's a real crisis. On the other hand, I read something else that was saying that. Uh, because of climate change emergency and all the rest of it, drastic population reduction is the answer to the crisis of overpopulation. So there's all sorts of contradictory reasons to be very pessimistic at the moment. On the other hand, there are optimists, of course, who point out, for example, that if you look at uh, absolute poverty the world over, it has been reduced by over a half, perhaps even three quarters, depending on the measure, just within the last three decades. That's a pretty impressive figure, isn't it? And they point to technology and uh, the vast uh, potential that there is to, to continue to transform human life for the better. But whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, these vocal protagonists of these things, they see the real solutions that our world needs, one way or another, as being found in this world, in the ingenuity in the actions of human beings. Of course, human beings do have great responsibilities for this world and great capabilities to shape this world, either for good or for evil. But here's a stubborn fact, friends. The grave is no respecter of persons, and both optimist and pessimist will, in the end, go the way of all flesh. And their life in this world will come to an end. And the solution to the ultimate problems of this world, the bondage to, to decay and to death that entraps every single human being, it cannot and it will not ever be found in this world. Nor will it be found either with the spaceships of Elon Musk or Richard Branson taking us to some other planet. It won't be found anywhere in this entire cosmos. Of course, Christians know that. And we know that, in fact, this world is coming to an end. And we're living in the last days of this present world as we know it. That's the clear teaching of the whole Bible, the teaching of Jesus. However old this, this universe may be, and some of the scientists will tell us it's billions of years old, that the Bible's interest is in human history. And it tells us plainly that the former days of human history are coming to an end with the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, into this world. He has come to reveal the ultimate and final word of God for our world. We saw it in Hebrews 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke in many different ways by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. An ultimate word, a final word, and an ultimate warning, therefore. The whole world as we know it is going to be shaken to its core so that everything that has been made will be removed in order that, as, as chapter 12 puts it, the things that cannot be shaken will remain. That is the unshakable, everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose throne and rule, as we, as we saw last time in chapter 1, is forever and ever, chapter 1, verse 8. While this present world will perish, verse 11 of chapter 1, Jesus Christ is the same. His years and his kingdom will have no end. In a glorious new creation, in the kingdom of, of everlasting, permanent righteousness and peace and perfection. That is what salvation means, according to the Christian gospel. Nothing less than that. 
That's what the return of Christ will mean, as, as we read in chapter 9, as we'll come to it, when Jesus appears a second time to save, to bring salvation at last to all those who are eagerly awaiting him. Salvation. The answer to every need of this present world, to every need, every desire of every human being. That is not going to be found, friends, anywhere ever within this dying universe. Salvation is all about the world to come. Look at chapter 2, verse 5, the first verse of our passage today. It's the world to come of which we're speaking, he says. Referring back to the end of chapter 1 and all these great visions of glory. But really, he means the whole focus of what he's speaking about through this letter, this salvation, is the world to come. Set your minds and your hearts there. That's your home. And it's there alone that you will find the rest and the peace and the fulfillment that you long for, that God has created you for. Not ever in this world. So keep looking forward. Don't drift back. Salvation can't be yours if you drift back and, and find peace with this world. Only if you persevere and endure to that world to come. Yeah, that's the warning we saw last time at the very beginning, the first paragraph uh, of chapter 2. Don't drift back from the gospel of glorious hope that lies ahead. If you do that, he says in verse 3, you're neglecting such a great salvation and in danger of losing it. Why does he give such a stark warning? Well, of course, because it's very hard, isn't it, to live in this world, surrounded by all the, the tangible and apparently solid realities of this world, but to live for a world as yet unseen and not yet possessed. It's hard. And especially so if you're facing many battles, many struggles, opposition, persecution from the culture around you, as these Christians that he's writing to first almost certainly were. But we understand that, don't we? We might not be facing persecution like that in our in our world, in our lives, stark suffering. But the Christian life is never easy. There are great temptations all the time, aren't there, to throw in the towel, to find a way of peace with this world, to find a way of peace with your own worldly desires. It's very strong, isn't it? It certainly is for me. And Hebrews was written for all Christians, including us, because we are all a pilgrim people in this world. We're still a people in the wilderness. We're not yet fully home. Palmer Robertson puts it so well. We're in a place of deliverance, but also a place still of danger. And friends, here's the truth. That is the way it will be right until the very end of your life of faith and of mine. I'm sure many of you have read John Bunyan's great allegory of the Christian life, The Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't, you really ought to. Let me encourage you to. But do you remember what the very last line of that great story is? Here it is. Then I saw that there was a way to hell even from the gates of heaven. A stark warning, the last line of The Pilgrim's Progress. And that's why Hebrews gives us throughout its chapters, a word of exhortation, as he says at the end, to persevering faith, to endurance, to the end. Because Jesus himself said, it's those who endure to the end who will be saved. And Hebrews exhorts us with words both of, of encouragement but also of warning, because we need both, don't we? He wants to perturb the comfortable with real and necessary warnings. We all need that. Of course, he also wants to comfort the perturbed because we need that too, especially when we're facing struggles and battles and pressures without and pressures within, especially when we're surrounded by, by the world's woe and when we feel very keenly inside our own weakness. We need encouragement. We need hope. And so right after that powerful warning in the first paragraph there, he turns in the rest of chapter 2 to remind us of the great hope that we have for the world to come if we keep looking to Jesus Christ. Because you see, it's in him and it's through him alone that we have real and living hope. And he says to us here that in Jesus we have a great revelation 
and we've had a great rescue, and we can find, therefore, in him great reassurance. Look at verses 5 to 9. He says, we have as, as struggling pilgrims in this dark world, we have in Jesus Christ a great revelation. Jesus is our hope. And he shows us this crown of life. Jesus shows us that there's hope for the future through the splendor of his heavenly coronation. Verse 9, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. It's the world to come that we're speaking about, he says in verse 5. It's a heavenly world to come, but that's not a world about angels and the like. It's a world for man. It's about humanity. The world to come is for human beings. And that's been the focus of God's story of salvation right from the very beginning. That's been God's ultimate purpose, that his purpose for creation should be fulfilled by the recreation of this fallen world into a new heaven and earth for human beings. And that's what Hebrews is all about, the world to come, the age to come, as he calls it in chapter 6, verse 5. The city that's to come, as he calls it in chapter 13, verse 14, I think it is. That's what the Christian gospel is all about, the world to come. It's not about making this world a better place. Well, of course we want to make this world a better place. It's not about, though, healing or prosperity or peace or fulfillment in this world. It's the world to come about which we're speaking when we're speaking about the gospel of salvation. It's an everlasting heavenly kingdom that will never be shaken. And that's what the patriarchs like Abraham were living for from the very beginning. They desired a heavenly country, we're told in chapter 11. For he has promised them a city, the city that has eternal foundations. That's what the prophets and the psalmists were longing for and speaking about. Psalm 93 begins this way, the Lord reigns, he's robed in majesty. Yes, the world is established, the eternal world forever. It shall never be moved. The unshakable eternal world of God's promised kingdom. So friends, let's be clear, the real and the only answer to this world's problem is that all our human hopes and longings and so on are to be found there in the world to come. But what a wonderful, wonderful revelation of hope that is because he is speaking about the, the permanent peace, the permanent justice and beauty of everything that he quoted in these passages of Scripture in the second half of chapter 1 where, where wickedness is banished, where justice reigns forever, for years without end, where darkness is defeated and Eden really is restored. That's what he's picturing here, you see, in verses 6 to 8, quoting from Psalm 8. Centers on the astonishing dignity, the majesty of humanity, of man, crowned with glory and honor, king over creation, everything in subjection under man's feet, nothing left outside his control. That's what you see, isn't it, when you go right back to the beginning and you read Genesis chapter 2. All creation in perfect harmony, guided and and ruled over by perfect humanity and perfect power, perfect wisdom, perfect beauty. But of course, that isn't what we see, is it, when we look around at our world today? So to talk like that about humanity, does that mean that the Bible's just fantasy? It's just talking nonsense? It's un unrealistic? Well, actually, no, look at verse 8. The Bible's perfectly honest, isn't it? At present, he says, we do not see this picture of perfect subjugation of humanity. We don't see it since Genesis chapter 3. What we do see, in fact, is an awful corruption of humanity, which is the result of the dreadful rebellion of man against God, against God's rightful place and our rightful place in the universe. Man was created by God, not not as God, lower than the heavenly beings, the angels, higher though than, than all the other creatures because he was created to rule over all things under God as God's perfect image and steward. But human beings have rebelled and turned the entire picture right upside down. 
Man now wants to be above all heavenly beings. Man wants to be his own God in control of everything himself. And that's our world, isn't it? Human, human autonomy rules. I decide what I do. I decide who I am. I decide what I am now in all kinds of different ways. Human beings, you see, have become their own rulers, their own gods. And yet the paradox is that at the same time, we say that we're not the crown of creation. We're not special. We're not made unlike animals in the image of God to be over all the animals and over all the beasts. We're just like them. We're just part of the same chance evolutionary river of life. We're not special creatures made in God's image. So we're just beasts like the rest of the animal kingdom. But that's a very frightening thing, isn't it? Because that means that we're saying that we're just beasts who are, in fact, God. And that's the story of human history. That's the world of humanity that we do see at present. The arrogant rule of man towards creation. It's not the gracious rule over creation for God. It's the greedy rule of creation for ourselves. We see it towards one another. It's the rule of beasts, isn't it? It's dog-eat-dog -dog in the world. We see it nationally. We see it internationally. We see it individually, too. Survival of the fittest, the best. That's the world of the selfish gene that Professor Dawkins describes so well. And at times throughout history, when great human beasts of power have reared their head in the world, the great evil empires, think of the ancient Assyrians, the Babylonians, well, think of the Nazis in, in more recent times, or the Marxists, for whom genocide was always for the many, never for the few. Think of ISIS in our own time. When the great beasts of humanity rear their head, that's where we see the rule of the great beast of human life that has been so visibly, so violently twisted from God's creation. No wonder, is it, that the, the Bible's imagery of earthly rule of man. When you read John's vision uh, in the book of Revelation, the Bible's image of that is the rule of the beast, the beast, and the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, the number of the beast. Nothing to do with crazy nonsense of Hollywood films. It's perfectly straight and straightforward. We're told it's the number of man. It's the identification of the rule of man, rebellious, autonomous humanity as we know it. And that is the world that we see and we know. And there's not very much hope there, is there? Nothing but despair. So we don't see that. But, look at verse 9. We do see Jesus. In the face of the, the terrible present reality of the unmanning of man, of the corruption of humanity all around us, this world has seen at last, to use Martin Luther's phrase, the proper man. In Jesus Christ, in his human flesh. Psalm 8, you see, expected the world to come, to be subject not to angels, but to human beings, everything under his feet. Just as Psalm 110 was quoted in chapter 1, for seeing everything under the feet of the Son of God. And it is so already, he's saying, in the human flesh of Jesus Christ. You see that in his earthly ministry, don't you? Read the Gospels if you've never read one. Here's a man ruling over the beasts in the wilderness. Here's a man ruling over even the winds and the waves that obey him. Ruling over all of nature. Multiplying a few loaves to feed 5,000. Turning water into wine. Ruling, having sovereign power even over sickness and death itself. As a man. That was the cry, wasn't it? What kind of a man is this? And notice here in verse 9, the one who, who is the divine son that's been talked about all the way through chapter 1. The son of God radiating the glory and the light of God. He's named now, isn't he, emphatically as what? A human being, Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. And now already, by his resurrection from the dead, God has begotten his firstborn human being into the heavenly world to come. We saw that in chapter 1 verse 6. The firstborn, whom all the angels are bowing down to. A man glorified in the person of Jesus Christ. The second man, the true man, the true Adam. At last, restoring the image of God 
that the first Adam lost by that great act of rebellion. Jesus is the true hope for our humanity. He shows us the crown of life that man was created for, man was destined for, and is now redeemed for in the world to come. And that's what the gospel's about. It's about the world to come, where human beings raised from the dead will be crowned with glory to reign forever, darkness defeated and Eden restored. And that's a, a vision of wonderful hope, isn't it? For human beings in a world of pessimism, of, of fear, of despair. But that, nothing less than that, is what the Christian gospel is all about. It's about a new creation. It's about the world to come. And yes, we don't see yet everything subject to perfect human rule. But already, it's certain. And in the resurrection of Jesus, his crowning glory and honor has been seen he has shown us the crown of life. And in Jesus, we have a great revelation of hope. He is our hope. He's the hope for all humanity forever. He's the firstborn of the world to come. Apostle Paul puts it very similarly in Colossians chapter 1, where he says, For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the firstborn from the dead. And through him, he reconciles to himself all things in earth or heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, Jesus is our hope. He's the firstborn of a whole new humanity, the first who will share that glorious crown with us, with many brothers and sisters. But you notice Paul said there in Colossians, only, only through a great reconciliation by the blood of his cross. And that's exactly what Hebrews is telling us here. Look at verse Nine. Jesus is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. We can't separate the great revelation of our human future from the awful reality of the necessary great rescue from our human past. And that's what verses 10 to 17 are all about. You see, he's saying that in Jesus, we have a great rescue. He's saying Jesus is our hero who has saved us from the curse of death. Jesus saves us from the horror of the past through the suffering of his earthly crucifixion. Verse 15, that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that's the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. God hasn't just spoken about the glory of the world to come and shown it to us in the triumph of Jesus. Jesus came to lead us to share in that glory forever. He'll share his crown with us. But you see, to do that, he must suffer the cross for us. And that's what these verses make so clear to us, that the, the splendor of the, the promised crown can come only through the suffering of one who is our powerful champion. Verse 10, the founder, the, the captain, the champion of our salvation. Let's think first of all about this sharing of his crown. Verses 9 to 13 major on that. You can see he'll share his crown with all his brothers, with all his family. In the beginning of creation, God, God didn't just plan a single solitary Adam, did he? He wanted a vast family of human beings to fill the earth, to rule over it, to, to flood the whole creation with the image of God. And that's what's going to happen in the new creation. Verse 10, Jesus came to bring many sons to glory for God. Because, verse 11, he who sanctifies, he who sets them apart for that holy future, and those whom he sanctifies, they're all of one, literally. Probably means all of one humanity. Might mean all of one family. But either way, the point is, he's sharing with many. He's leading many others to share his glory. And that's what the, the Bible testifies to and promises all through which is why he quotes here from two places, from the Psalms and from Isaiah. In verse 12, Psalm 22, you know that Psalm, it begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quoted it on the cross. But it goes on to speak about the, the psalmist, the great king of Israel, rejoicing in God's victory on his behalf and saving him and therefore all his people with him. 
we join in praise to God with him. And that pattern, that prophecy was fulfilled so marvelously in the person of Jesus and his cross. And then in verse 13, again, it quotes from, from Isaiah chapter 8, where God's prophet was the savior of many then when he trusted God and, and put his faith in God in the face of great opposition and, and, and great danger from enemies. And God delivered him and, and all his children, all of the people who stood with him. It echoes Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 where he prays that they also whom you have given to me, the children you've given to me, will be with me where I am and see my glory. Jesus sanctifies all his people. He sets them apart for that glorious future with him. Human beings, brothers who share the same flesh. Notice verse 16, not angels, not glorious beings in their own right, but men and women of flesh and blood. Isn't that astonishing? That, that he, verse 10, for whom and through whom all things exist on heaven and earth, that he's focused not, not on the fearsome splendor of angels, but on the frail, sinful flesh of human beings. The world to come is not for angels. It's for us. It's not angels he helps. It's the offspring of Abraham. The ragtag people of God, full of weakness, full of failures, full of waywardness, all through their history, and no less so today. He's the creator of all things, and yet he's utterly committed to his children, his people of promise. And look at verse 11. Our Lord Jesus is not ashamed to call us, his brothers and sisters, to share his crown with us. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be blameless and holy before him to the praise of his glorious grace which he, with which he blessed us in the beloved, in Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, he says. And so says Hebrews here, you see, because in order that he might share his crown with us, with all his brothers, he had to share and suffer the cross for all his brothers. Because sin's curse can't be wished away, can it? Sin has to be washed away. And so for his people to be made like him, we're told he had to be made like them so that he could be for them the great champion of our salvation who slays the tyrant to liberate his people. Look at verse 9. He was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and death so that he might taste death for everyone. That is for all his family, for the many sons he's bringing to glory, for his brothers and sisters, for the children of flesh and blood, for the offspring of Abraham. That is for everyone who through faith in Jesus Christ become his people, the true seed of Abraham. That's important. He's not saying everyone without exception. All people will share that glorious salvation. No, he, he became the source of salvation, says chapter 5, verse 9, very clearly, the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. My mother and sister and brothers, said Jesus, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. But for those who do, you see, his family of faith, his brothers, he is the champion of our salvation. That word in verse 10, champion, translated in our Bibles, founder. Well, some, some people think he's, he's making a reference here to the, the Greek stories of heroes that the readers would be very familiar with, Hercules and the like. I don't think we really need to even think that because the Bible is so full of that image of God as the great hero for his people and God's king. Think of the story of David and Goliath, the champion for all his people against the tyrant. Or think of what Jesus says in Luke chapter 11 about coming in and binding the strong man in the house so that he's overcome, binding Beelzebul, the prince of demons. If you read in the prophets, the prophets like Isaiah, you'll find constantly that God himself said he would become his people's champion. I, the Lord, will go and fight for them like a mighty man, he says in Isaiah 42. I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children and all flesh will know that I am the Lord your God, he says in Isaiah 49. 
Well, he, in Jesus, became the champion of our salvation to destroy, look at verse 14, to destroy the one who had, the tyrant, who had the power of death, that is the devil, and to free us from the fear of death. Because that is the fear of death. That is what subjects every human being to bondage. Think about it. David Gooding is very helpful in this. And and he says that it's this fear of death. It's the fear of what lies beyond the grave that makes perhaps the majority of the people on this earth live in bondage to all kinds of religious rites and sacrifices and offerings and rituals. All things that are, that are designed to lessen the pain, lessen the, the potential punishment that they might face beyond death in, in whatever it is that lies beyond. Human religion is all about trying to allay that fear, that anxiety of, of, of what there is beyond death, the great unknown. That's why when, you, when they dig up Egyptian tombs, they find they're full of all sorts of things that are there to, to aid the deceased person on the life into the beyond. That's why countless lives all over the world today are enslaved by rituals and offerings and prayers and spells and all of these things. Of course, in our culture, more recently, people have tried to allay the fear of what might lie beyond by trying to convince themselves that there's nothing beyond, that death ends everything, but that also leads to bondage. Because if this life is all there is, then you become a slave, don't you, to time and to passing time. You're desperately trying to stop that clock advancing so rapidly. And so you're a slave to your diet or to your gymnasium or to your medicines or to everything else. Or indeed, you're a slave to mindless hedonism, to get everything done on your bucket list before at last you're beaten by death. Or perhaps you're a slave to the bondage that if death does end everything, then there never will be any justice for you if you've suffered cruel injustice in this life. Or there is no hope for betterment for you if you've suffered some grave deprivation in life, health-wise or emotionally or in any other way. See, all of these are different forms, aren't they, of bondage to that great fear that death inflicts. Death is the great enemy of the human race. But death is what Jesus, our great champion, came to save us from. And that is what salvation means. Nothing less than that. It's the death of death forever. It's not about improving this world a little bit or this life a little longer. It's about rescue from this world. And rescue from the judgment to come, which is real. As we'll see in Hebrews 9, it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. But you see, Jesus, our champion, our hero, has defeated the power of death. Look at verse 9. How has he done it? Through the suffering of death. Verse 10, through suffering, that is through his death. Verse 14, through his death he delivered his people. Verse 18, he himself suffered. That is, in his death on the cross. You see, that's remarkable, isn't it? Our great champion, the mighty warrior, the destroyer of the ultimate enemy, how does he destroy him? Not through superhuman strength, but through suffering and sacrifice. Why is that so? Well, you see, verse 17, he suffered to make propitiation for the sins of his people. Because the sting, the real sting of death, friends, is sin. That's what condemns us to the judgment of God. That's what condemns us to the wrath of God without hope. It's sin that holds us as slaves to the devil. So it's only when sin is dealt with that we can be liberated from the power of death. And so verse 10 says it was fitting that our great champion Savior was made perfect, was was equipped for his role. That's what that language means. Through suffering. And that language of being made perfect is the language that the Old Testament uses of the setting apart and the equipping of the great high priest of Israel. Because you see, that role of savior was the role of the one who reconciles sinners to God through 
through sacrifice. It was the role of the high priest. And here is the true and ultimate high priest who could bring real forgiveness forever for our sins. So you see, verse 17 really sums it up. He had to be made like us in every respect so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Do you see, the only champion who could ever rescue us from the tyrant power of death was the high priest who could make propitiation for our sins and thus reconcile us to God through his own suffering and death to pay the price of our sins as one of us for us. Had to be a death for sins. But there was, there were his death for us. And so our perfect Savior was a faithful high priest to God, upholding his perfect justice, and a merciful high priest to us, unleashing that perfect love for all his people, for all his children, for every seed of Abraham, whom Jesus is unashamed to call his brothers. Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. A great rescue through Jesus, our hero, who has saved us from the curse of death in order to share with us the crown of life. And so finally, you see in verse 18, we have in Jesus, our Savior, great reassurance that Jesus is our helper. He can sustain us in our calling to endure. Jesus sustains us with help in the present through all the struggles of our heavenly calling because he himself was tested by what he suffered to the very end. So he's able to help us when we're being tempted. He's one of us and he endured to the end. He was tested even through the suffering of death. And so he's able to help us through every trial of suffering, through every temptation of sin. He's not ashamed to stand with you and me, to walk with us, however frail and weak that we are. We're his brothers and sisters. It's us he's interested in helping, not the, not the dazzling angels as verse 16 talks about. It's not them he helps, it's us. It's Abraham's feeble seed. I love that. God's attention is not on the splendor of angels. I suspect that means his attention is not on grandiose spiritualities. It's not on the great cathedrals and the statue of angels, statues of angels. If he's not interested in the real thing, why is he interested in all that? What's he interested in? He's interested, well, what did Jesus say? Even where two or three are gathered together in my name, that's where I am, in the midst. Because I'm not ashamed to call you my brothers and sisters. I'm there to help you. In your little prayer triplet, when you gather together to pray for one another and the struggles you're facing, he's there to help you. In your Bible studies, you gather together to encourage one another in the Word. Wherever it is, wherever believers are seeking the help of the Lord Jesus Christ, he, our faithful Savior, is there to help us endure in this hostile world. He's for us. He's our champion of salvation to help us with all his heavenly power and with all his human understanding of our frame and our weakness. And he's not ashamed of us to call us brothers and sisters. Isn't that a great reassurance? Especially when maybe things are hard or we are facing struggle as we surely will in our Christian lives. Friends, Christianity without struggle and suffering isn't real Christianity, according to the New Testament. And there are powerful lures, aren't there, for us today to, to a kind of Christianity that avoids suffering, that makes peace with this world, that appeases this world, that settles down into this world, and just takes up the campaigns of this world, the concerns of this world. That's the kind of Christianity that will be celebrated by this world. And the Lord Jesus will be ashamed of those who deny him and who deny his gospel and go that way. But he'll never be ashamed of those who endure suffering from the world and who don't embrace surrender to the world and so are castigated by the world and not celebrated by it. Never. He knows that road and he knows our flesh. Jesus is our helper. He will sustain us in our calling to endure. Therefore, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, look, holy brothers, 
and sisters, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle who came to show us the crown of life, the high priest who came to save us for that crown of life. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Look to Jesus and keep looking to Jesus, especially in dark trial, especially in deep temptation. He came in our flesh and he shed his own blood to redeem those sin held so strongly. Death bound us as slaves, but he rose up from the grave and we will follow our brother to glory. Jesus is our hope. He shows us the crown of life that's ours. And he's our hero. He saves us for that crown of life, bearing the curse for us. And he's our helper. He will sustain us in our calling to endure. So let us then, with confidence, keep on drawing near, as the Hebrews writer tells us, to that throne of grace, to receive mercy and to find grace, to help us in time of need. Let's pray. We pray in the words of a prayer of a brother Christian who went before us in the fourth century, long ago, Ambrose of Milan. Merciful Lord, the comforter and teacher of your faithful people, increase in your church the desires which you have given and confirm the hearts of those who hope in you by enabling them to understand the depths of your promises that all your adopted children may even now behold with the eyes of faith and patiently wait for the light which as yet you do not openly manifest through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close one of the old Scottish paraphrases taken from the book of Hebrews. Jesus, the Son of God, who once for us his life resigned, now lives in heaven, our great high priest and never dying friend. Grace to help 
in time of need, while days of trial last. Because he himself was tested in suffering. He's able to help those who are being tested. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all until the end. Amen. Amen. Thank you.